the perfected ones, the plural, those that are being perfected. And that's why he said in verse 13, you should be those types of teachers. Not to be teachers, he said, but you should be those diktatoi, always those types of teachers who teach mysteries and secrets. You, you shouldn't just be teachers of the fundamentals, he's saying. You should understand all of this so you can teach out of this some details. That's what verse 12 was talking about, of the mysteries and secrets. But verse 14, he says, the solid food is for adults and those who are possessing faculties. And he talked about it's their constant practice. It's their habit. That's what he means by possessing. Their habit, their faculty, their possessing ongoing constant practice, their perceptions, their perceptions, he says, they have this distinguishment, this discrimination, so they exercise discrimination, but their perceptions are that they can have a discernment that's very heightened. So if you have a constant practice of eating solid food, you're gonna have a heightened level of discernment of what is better for you. You're gonna know when you read, the more you read the Bible, it doesn't matter who you are. I don't care where you are in your faith. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter who you are. One thing is true. I remember this, the, the day is long. In 1993, in Calvary Bible Church, these people that didn't go to formal seminary, and they came around and I said, how do you know all this stuff? And the Bibles were worn out. And I said, you didn't go to school? No. Well, how did you? They said, all I can tell you is this. They said, if you read it every day with the intent to learn, and do that for every day, then for a week, then for a week, then for a month, and for a month, then for a year, then for a year, then so on. You'll find that as you look back, you will not believe how much you missed. And then go back and do it again, but this time study. Tell you the words. Pull out your dictionary, pull out your concordance, if you choose to do so. All I'm saying to you, they tell me, Brother Preston, is that the more you spend time, you will never be disappointed. Never. And that's what God means when he says, my word never returns void. You never sit at the feet of Jesus and walk away going, well, that was a waste. That, that never happens. Like, ever. <laughs> okay? Ever. He could say nothing. Still not a waste. He could say two words. Still not a waste. Uh-uh. Just being there, there's something you can gain. Always. <laughs> so I remember them telling me that's the whole point of the scripture, is how you approach it. How do you revere God and his word? So it says you have a heightened discernment. So in other words, the more you read it, the more you start finding patterns. Oh, I remember reading something about that over there. Oh, I remember that word is over there. Or oh, I remember, and that's how it happens to me when I'm studying. I'm like, oh, I remember that over there. So he says here, not only are they habitually exercised, not only are they doing this constant practice, not only are they distinguishing with a heightened level of, of discernment, but now they're it says they're having this discrimination both of good and evil. They're ascertaining agathos versus kalos, and that's the words for good and evil. Good is, is, is the, oh, excuse me, agathos. It's kalos versus uh, kakos, my apology. So kalos and, and kakos. And kalos is the good that comes out of you. God has to first, remember Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's none good but God, meaning agathos. There's no agathos disposition. There's no internal good person zero but God. And he goes, why oh, you call me good? There's only one good but God. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. That means you know that I'm the guy. <laughs> and they didn't realize what they were saying. And he's like, do you, do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> and they're like, well, now I do. You say it that way. But what he's saying to us in Christ is we're the same way. We have no agathos disposition. But when he forges in us an agathos disposition, you know he is doing that when out of us flows a callous good. This is where details matter again, because in the King James and other versions, they just say, good is good is good is good, 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 good. No, there's a good that means agathos, internal disposition, and there's a good that means kalos, which is an external disposition. So the agathos of the sporos sits in us, then God's truth of what his word means to us, his absolute truth and living and alive, resonates in us that out of us would be, for example, the one of the basic fruits of that, is that we treasure and memorize scripture. So if God's word now in the sperma, agathos resides in us, 
and the details of his mysteries and secrets and inheritances and salvation resides in us, then the callous fruit of that is we become more distinctly detailed at examination of God, his word, and ourselves. You, you, you can't not do that if you claim to have that disposition. It's like impossible. And that's what he's talking the book of Hebrews about. You guys are saying you have this, but you're not doing this. Do you realize the warnings are because you're not doing things that are expected given what you've been given? And that's a dangerous, slippery slope to be on. Be aware. That's, that's, that's not good. And so that's the process of what he was talking about in, in Hebrews there. But then he says, kakos means a disposition of character that's, that's just disposed to do evil, wickedness. You know, like Jezebel. She was kakos through and through. 100% cackles. Like Herod during John the Baptist's day. He was cackles through and through. Pilate, he was, he was, he was, wishy, he was wishy-washy. He wasn't so cackles. Herod was cackles. Caiaphas, cackles. He wanted intentionally to kill Jesus. Eliminate the bell curve. Get the A student out of the class. If he can gain back control. No doubt. So you have cackles disposition exhibits itself and it's its fruit that it does is that it, it just it attacks with vehemency the person of God and the Word of God. It is anti-Christ, Jesus orientated, anti-Jesus, anti-Christ spirit, and it's an anti-biblical approach. So people who are cacos disposition always have an indifference of emotional reaction when things of God are brought up, or when things of the Word of God are brought up. So God, Jesus, Bible is brought up. They get an emotional reaction. That's retaliatory. That's a sign of a cacos disposition. That's not good. That's a corrupt character disposition is what that is. Because whether you believe in him or not, why would that bring such a rise out of you like that? What's going on with you? What's that about? Right? That, that, that shouldn't be the case. So that's what he's saying. That, so he's saying you can just tell the difference between someone who's like that. A kekos disposition also means a person who could believe in God, but yet have that same attitude toward anything to do with God or his word because they had become apostates. This is where our churchianity friends get confused. Well, apostates aren't saved. Yeah, they are. In order to stand away from something, I have to know that something exists. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. <laughs> Think. I can't say I'm no longer going to use that hair product. Well, then that means I know it exists, right? Hello? <laughs> right? I'm no longer going to buy that product. I'm no longer going to go to that store. Well, that means I had to have known about it. If I stand away from apostasis something, that means I already know it exists. Our church and Andy friends don't understand Romans 1 when people said they suppressed the truth and they exchanged the truth of God for lies. You don't go to the retail store and exchange what you don't have. You exchange what you already have. I'm just saying. Just saying. So this is what he's talking about. The Kakos people are exchanging, are standing away from truth, exchanging truth for lies. An Agathos person surrenders their sinful nature because they know nothing of them could result in callous good. Nothing. Whereas a Kakos person believes they can pull it off. And even worse, they believe that nothing of God is worth focusing on because it's just too confounding, too restrictive, too complicated, too hurtful. Too much bad memories. You know, like people, to be fair, of of God have gone through quite a bit. They didn't like that Jesus' apostles lived charmed lives. Li lived charmed lives. How about their family members? How they have to endure seeing their loved ones die the way they did? Sawn in half, skinned alive, upside down crucified, staked in the ground, heads chopped off, boiled. How do you like to be their family members and talk about how God loves your family member who was killed like that? What does that do to you? Does that make you believe in God more? You say, oh yeah, sure. I read a story about Corey Tim Boom and about how she herself wanted to have so much anger 
toward a guard because how he treated, I think it was her sister, a female guard struck her in the face for no reason for her trying to show love and compassion to somebody else who was in need of some compassion. And so she was beaten. And Corey had such a hard time with it that her sister had to say, the bitterness is not something that's going to help you any in the anger. You have to let it go. The one who was the victim had to tell her sister, I believe it was her sister, to say, no, I know what you're saying, and I, believe, I thank you for loving me. That's not what God would want from us. But boy, she had a hard time getting over that sense of, what do you do with that? How do you, how do you accept God's will in your life in a way that you're seeing someone you love? It's hard enough on yourself when someone you love is the one who's being hurt. It always changes the dynamic when God does something in your life or allows things in your life that are not pleasant to you, then you add the other caveat or to someone that you love. Do you still trust and believe in him then? Can you discern within yourself that the cacos disposition that your sinful man has, your old man, needs to be squashed? You need to allow the agathos piece of how the spirit of Christ in you is supposed to sow that in you to bring out the callous fruit of trust and faith in God. Can you do that? Because an adult person, he says, who's, who's, who's dieting on solid food, can ascertain not, not just who's doing that, when they themselves are tempted to do that. They can ascertain this because they have a heightened discernment. And you get better and better at staying away from situations and people that are not helpful to you, that are harmful and want nothing to do evil unto you. It's okay to love, but you can't be subjected to people that want to cause you pain and hurt and sorrow constantly. That's not healthy for anybody. So, all right, so we're going to stop here with the book of Hebrews and how he talks about, again, uh, being matured. He's not done yet. In chapter 6, he's going to build on this theme of maturity, but now in chapter 6, he's going to build on a different level of doctrine of the anointed he talks about. There's different elements of the anointed or Christ, Yeshua's doctrine. He's going to talk about that level, whereas in chapter 5, verse 12, it was the elements of the sporos. Now he's getting involved in the elements of the sperma in chapter 6. Again, another indication about where their mindset's at. They couldn't even hear about who Jesus is and what, he is, what he's going to do because of how their hearing has become dull. So he then went back to telling them, understand the first principles of the sporos, understanding that led you to the principles of of the sperma, but let's look deeper into what Christ laid down for us in these principles of sperma, of mysteries and secrets, and how those speak to what we're supposed to have at stake for us in the future. And that's the reason why Hebrews 6 is the most often confusing, conflictory commentary you'll ever read about. Have a fun walk down, uh, you know, research lane and look up commentaries on Hebrews 6, and you will find a plethora of contradictions of confoundedness, of people's own words saying, I don't know, they're like that Forky from Toy Story, I don't know, they, they all act like that. They got no clue. They're so confused when they read Hebrews 6. It's because of what I just said. Because of what God has built up to and been saying through the book. It wasn't written for just anybody. And it therefore was not just written to just pick up this chapter and zoom off the page with your preconcept mindset. No, 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 no. Read the flow, like follow the CSI crime scene. Don't come in Monday morning quarterback and tell me the butler did it. D d first of all, stop. You weren't here for the investigation. You didn't do the interrogations. You didn't get. You didn't talk to the medical examiner. You didn't see the scene of the crime. You didn't. El you didn't examine the gun. You have no idea. You d the butler did it. Stop. You're showing yourself to be a fool by speaking so ignorantly about something. You've spent zero time to figure out the dynamics of all that's involved. Do God a, a respectful gesture. How about this? How about listen to him? Read his word. Study what he said. Follow it through. And then get to chapter 6 and then tell me what you think it means. Don't do the opposite and believe what people think they think it means and say they and all. No, no, no. Don't do that. You're never going to understand what it means. And that's why they're all confused because they go into it the wrong way or they don't read the, the flow into chapter 6. I can guarantee you this. If you go into it the right way and you read the flow the way it's supposed to read, 
you might not understand everything about chapter 6, but you're going to have a way better grasp on what it means because God has taken and honored your disposition of you respecting him and how he wrote his word to be understood. Understand the, the intent of how and what it was written for and who it was written to and what he's saying led up to that particular chapter. And when you do that, then you'll be in the best position, whatever your, whatever your knowledge is, you'll be in a better, a better position to understand what he's saying. And you'll be at the best position when you take those two things and add more details of this exegesis to it, studying the words, oh my goodness, it's even better. So we'll end with that, and we'll, we'll close and pray, pick up on Sunday with chapter 6 of Hebrews. So Father, thank you for this day, for the time we have together. Thank you for your love, your peace, your joy, and just your ongoing fellowship as our Father and our Shepherd. Thank you again in this time of, of our world, our country, and of all peoples that we look on the health scares and concerns and we remember that you did not give us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, truth, love. You are our spirit of truth. You are our guide, our restorer, our deliverer. You are a rock, never moving, ever steady. And so we thank you that through all things in life, regardless of how the world sees it or how society sees it, we know that we have an immovable, unchangeable, reliable, dependable, absolutely magnificently awesome Father, God, Savior, Restorer, and Master of our lives. Captain of the ship, you are our anchor in troubled storms. We know we won't be moved, but our faith in you what we experience, what we think, what we feel is all real, but it's not relevant to the truth of who you are and the truth of whose we are in you. Help us, guide us, convict us, and challenge us to be better as children, to be content with where we are, as you where you have us, but never be satisfied that that is okay to stop. Contentment, accepting where we're at. Satisfaction, always being thirsty, always being thirsty for your righteousness, to want more of you and more of understanding of you and your word. So have us be in that state of mind, Father. We thank you, and we ask you to dismiss us and bring us back together safely again Sunday. In Jesus' Yeshua's name, amen. Sorry. <laughs>